Dragon, uh, urine's not in the GI tract, of course it's the GU tract. That's very, that's likely to be sterile. But any condition that causes any of those bodily fluids to occur, you have to assume that they're intermingled. Um, there's no safe bodily fluid. But blood is, if you see invisible blood, that is the biggest. Yes? A lot of times chasers have the first word to be in the area that they're dead. So do you recommend transporting the first year of your program? Good question. So should I transport somebody to an area if I can help? That's a hard one to answer because there's both a yes and a no answer to that. The first is, in Joplin, were it not for people using their personal vehicles to transport people to the hospital, I believe the toll would have been higher. Because some of the people who made it to the hospital were just barely alive by the time they were brought by personal vehicles. But keep in mind what I said about liability. Once you commit to doing that, if your intentions are good, that's great. But if you're reckless in any way on the way back to that hospital and trying to figure out where to go, and it ends up resulting in harm, it is possible it could be a liability situation. I don't think anyone's going to care in a job and ask scenario. But at the same time, do you know enough about head and neck injuries to feel comfortable transporting people? If they have just injuries to their limbs and no head injuries, you can be very helpful. Um, and in fact, Cloud9 tours help the job on transporting someone just like that. And so I think it's, you know, you just need to know your comfort zone. Yes? Can you put your slide up for the uh, hotline number? Uh, the hotline number, sure. Uh, can you take us back to that? It's uh, way back in the beginning. <coughs> um, so, sure, I'll be happy to do that. And just so you know, it's 904-343-4300. All right, next. Yes? Can you also, next after that one, put the um, one that has the link to the training up? To the training for, for yeah. FEMA? Yeah. The ICS? Sure. So there's, there's that. I'm the handsome devil over here, Piotrowski. You know, just a face built for radio for that one. Um, all right. Uh, so I, can you try and find <laughs> I don't know why I give him so much. Because he's no, I, I love him and Aaron. Uh, other questions? Tim? Yep. Can you describe what you did in Joplin? So that's a great question. What did I do in Joplin? And one of the things Tim asked me was surgery. And I can tell you from my experience on Thanksgiving that I'm not allowed to handle utensils that are sharper than a spoon. Um, because I am not a surgeon by any stretch of the imagination. On Joplin, I spent a lot of time diagnosing and treating patients who were transferred from St. John's Hospital, which was uh, the one that was destroyed in Joplin. And I also spent time taking care of patients in the trauma bays for a time. And between those two areas, I took over care of about 50 patients that day. And it, like I said, it was the best night of medicine ever. You know why? You didn't have to write any notes. <laughs> for those of you in healthcare, you'll go, oh yeah, testify, sister. Testify. <laughs> I have never once seen a triage tag used. They're beautiful, and I'm sure they do that somewhere, in some way, shape, or form. But there's a lot of marking on patients. I like to mark patients. Triage tags basically denoting whether somebody is uh, green, yellow, red, or black. Um, black is deceased. Green is the walking wounded. Um, yellow is moderately injured, and red is needs to be bumped to the top of the tape for surgery, etc. Um, and in theory, we have these tags that unfortunately also look a lot like toe tags. So a lot of people feel a smidge uncomfortable like we're planning ahead. Uh, but I'm sure they're used in proper districts. I've just never actually seen that. It's a great question. Yes? I work in medicine, so I understand the philosophy of the I don't know how many people here do what we're just talking about. There's a lot of tasks that we can get or that we can't do. Does everybody understand why we do that? That's a great question. The question is, do you understand why we don't help somebody who appears to be deceased? In, in a mass casualty. And the reason is because those patients have sustained injuries that are so severe they would warrant some form of surgery or life-saving preparation. The reality is the resources are going to be limited in a mass casualty incident. I was impressed at job on how many surgeries happened. I mean, it was unbelievable, including neurosurgeries that were done in job that night immediately. But we can't do that for everybody. So we have to triage who can we say? Who can we say? Yes? What if that person is just unconscious, though? I mean, anybody laying on the ground is unconscious and they're 
this is a great point. And the question we had to do is, well, what if somebody's just unconscious? Here's the reality of what it's like on a disaster. You are not going to be able to tell a dead person from an unconscious person. In the old days, we used to have people do pulse checks and things like this and CPR. Those are gone, in part because the accuracy of a pulse check is really, with a trained provider, is only about 75% accurate. Meaning 75% of the time, we get it right. 25% of the time, we feel a pulse when there is none, or we, we don't feel a pulse and somebody has one. It's very hard to tell who's alive and who's not. People who are sustained unconscious on a multi-casualty incident are very unlikely to survive. Um, and that's another thing. So you want to really get to those who can help. Now you're welcome to check. If you think someone's breathing and just unconscious, that's okay. But, like we got several people in the ER that night in Joplin where they had severe brain trauma. Severe brain trauma. Skulls caved in, eyes pointing different directions. We were brought in on the hope that we could save them. Maybe we could have if that was the only injury, but we can't when there's more. Yes? So the point was made, and Jeff made this point very effectively after dropping, which is you can use spray paint to flag houses or locations that you think rescuers need to know about that you can't help with that. And that is absolutely correct. Spray paint on anything you can to get someone's attention if you have to keep moving. So that at least when rescuers get there, they're able to see what's going on. Rescuers will frequently use the door frame into the main house as a communication for other rescuers. So if you can do it somewhere else other than that, please do so, but you can use the door if you need to. Yes? I just want to add to the 911 call. Uh, Brad and I and I get really close to tornadoes. Unfortunately, we've done a lot of rescues. But if you do it through the 911, be as descriptive as possible what you see. Because your call is going to tell that firefighter or EMS what equipment you need to bring with them. You can call a helicopter, lifeline, and everything. So just be extremely descriptive when you get to the scene. Excellent. So the more detail you give, the better a rescue is going to be when you call 911. If there's parties trapped in the house, that's a big deal, or even just a car accident. There's a difference between there's a car accident, I think someone's injured, and there's a car accident, parties are in the car. Um, those change the dynamics tremendously. Um, so calling 911 is extremely important and being as descriptive as possible. By the way, with all the enhancements that have happened in our cell system, does a 911 operator know where you are? If you're not using a GPS program that at least provides you some guidance as to where you are, you need to get one as a chaser. There's no excuse for that. You have to have a GPS. By the way, if you're relying on your phone GPS, I hope that they also have network coverage where you're at. Because that's not, I mean, it will give you latitude and longitude. You need to have some idea what town you're in. I, I lose track when I'm chasing a storm. I'm no longer looking at what town I'm in. I'm looking at the road or the highway, but I don't know where I'm on it. You pick up the phone to dial one take a moment before you call and look at where you are before you call because that makes a huge difference. And also, don't call 911 after you've left the scene because you may not be able to remember where exactly you saw that. Yes? Was there cell coverage at Joplin? Towers down? Towers were down. Cell coverage was completely out, and the uh, telecommunications in the hospital were, were out when we first got there which led to a whole, I mean, I couldn't believe what it was like to have no cell phones. Here's one of the things I'll say about the people in Java. They're amazing to me. Those nurses and doctors didn't know the status of their own family members, and they kept working. You know, I was just passing through. They were able to keep working. I don't know that I have that kind of focus. Right? I mean, that's amazing. That's heroism, okay? They just continue to do their job. That's what you do. You do what's right in front of you. Yes? But then again, you never know when communication infrastructure is going to go down. As many people know in this room, when all else fails, amateur radio works. Yeah.
absolutely correct. Amateur radio, I said it earlier, I'm going to emphasize it again. You need to get your amateur radio license and get an amateur radio because that works. It doesn't require repeater towers or anything else to focus on simplex. And you can get in touch with people over vast miles. And if you're trained all the way up to general, you can use even the atmosphere itself to balance signals together. Yeah, this sounds like kind of an obvious question maybe, but um, can you give some brief points or tips on identifying when people actually need help? Because I, I find myself in a situation where you know, they're, I come across people and they're shaken up and, and maybe a little bit incoherent, but they say they're okay and they're covered in mud. And, and they actually do need help. So, yes. if, you know, someone who's not trained or experienced like me coming upon these people, and I can't actually identify whether or not they need medical assistance. It's a great point. So, how do you know somebody needs that medical assistance? Do. Here's the answer. There's debris and on them. Okay? That means if it's happened to that person, it's likely happened to others. People may say, I don't need help, I'm okay, everything's okay, we're just going to dig out. But here's the reality. We don't know about the people who were visiting their house, the people in either house next to them, um, other people who may be injured. So if you get waved <coughs> off, we don't need help. They're covered in debris like mud. That's it. That's 911. You are not in a position to judge whether that person does or does not need help, nor are they. They're covered in debris. I have never been covered in debris. I don't think I'd be picking my shirts. You know? Really. Yes? Back to the amateur radio. Are there standards? There are if you use ARIES, so I would recommend going down the ARIES, A-R-E-S path. They usually use standardized frequencies based on location. Um, I'm not an ARIES member, so I can't speak to that, but um, definitely a great question because that is, right, how are you going to know what station to choose when you have it all virtually infinite? Yes? Great. The ARIES spotters. Well, great. Um, ARIES has dedicated repeaters that are off sites <coughs> in the cities that they use as an emergency repeater system. If you are in a town that is devastated, the ARIES will actually activate a net on the repeater that they have dedicated. When you contact the ARIES specialist, they actually give you a card of their number one, number two, and number three repeater that they have listed for their center. <coughs> So guys, I'm going to stop the questions here at this point. I'm going to stick around afterward. Several things. This was an awesome chaser con. But if you get a mail or letter or newsletter thing from, from Roger asking for your help, help us as speakers be better for you guys. Um, we appreciate the feedback. Not just good job. But that doesn't tell me what I missed. Um, the other part is if you heard a speaker during the conference you thought was particularly effective or someone who you want to hear again, Please let Roger know because that's how the agenda is made up. I'm actually convinced it's more like pin the tail on the donkey, but um, in that case, I'm the tail. Uh, so um, I want to thank you guys for your attention today. I want to thank Roger and his wife Karen for a wonderful, wonderful uh, conference. I want to thank all of you guys who stuck around and said, You suck at us at home. You didn't bother to come here and give us free. What the hell is wrong? Hey folks, I got a couple more drawings here.